Welcome to the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee's 17th meeting of 2019. Before we move to the first item on the agenda, can I remind everyone to put their phones on silent or switch them off as they may affect the broadcasting system. Now, the first uh, item on our agenda is for the committee to take further evidence on the Climate Change Emissions redu Reductions Target Bill at Stage 2. And this morning, I'm delighted to welcome Rosanna Cunningham, the Cabinet Secretary for Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform. And the Cabinet Secretary is accompanied by to Dr Tom Russon, the Legislation Team Leader of the Decarbonisation Division, Sarah Granger, Team Leader of the Delivery Unit of the Decarbonisation Division, and Norman Munro, the Solicitor for the Scottish Government Legal Directorate. So good morning to you all. Um, Cabinet Secretary, um, there have been obviously some quite key developments since we last spoke to you. The First Minister has declared a climate emer emergency, and of course we've had the Committee for Climate Change's uh, report and recommendations. There's going to be, as we expected, transformational change needed. Do you think that the Scottish Government is currently structured to deliver that transformational change that's required by this climate emergency that we're facing? Well, um, obviously we're committed to doing what is needed um, and uh, 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 in respect of limiting global temperature uh, rises and that will have to be done responsibly. Um, in collaboration with Parliament and with um, people. Um, I did set out in the statement that I gave to uh, Parliament on the 14th of May that climate change is intended uh, to be at the heart of the next programme for government and spending review. But ultimately, decisions on whole government action are taken by Cabinet. Um, uh, and that is going to continue with both Cabinet and the Cabinet Subcommittee on Climate Change having key roles in deciding our approach. Um, I, I have to say, in respect of uh, overall structures of government, though, um, matters such as that are for the First Minister to make a decision on. Um, and uh, members will be aware um, when there are uh, new cabinets appointed, sometimes um, portfolio responsibilities are changed around, um, uh, different different issues are put in different portfolios. That's entirely a matter for the First Minister and I'm not venturing into that area because it is not for me to make that decision. Okay. Um, can I ask what actions the government's taken immediately to address this climate emergency as announced? Um, well, um, at the risk of just rehearsing the statement that I made on the 14th of May to the Chamber, I mean, obviously, um, uh, we're in uh, very early weeks. The very first step, effectively, was to lodge the amendments to our bill targets, which we lodged on the day we received the advice. Um, and that's uh, in keeping um, with the committee's recommendations. Um, we've accepted the committee's recommendations to update the climate change plan within six months of the bill receiving royal assent. Um, we've already announced uh, um, uh, actions on deposit return, agriculture, renewables and a change in the policy on air departure tax. We are now looking across the whole of government to see um, uh, that, uh, to make sure that we continue with the policies that are already in place, to see, uh, um, uh, to ensure that they are working, to increase action where necessary and where possible, um, and to identify whether or not there are areas that we can now um, move much faster on and over the summer there will be a programme for engagement um, uh, uh, with the public um, which has got to be a central part of all of this because we have got to um, ensure that the public is on board when we begin to talk about specific um, uh, um, policies that may or may not be required. One of the, things, the first things that you did in receipt of the CCC advice is contact the UK government, Claire Perry, I believe. Has there been a response to that letter for a meeting with Claire Perry? Um, uh, there has been a, a response uh, um, uh, from the Clean Air and Energy uh, Minister. Um, uh, it, it wasn't a response which answered any of the um, questions uh, in any meaningful way um, and uh, I think this morning the letter has gone back um, requesting that the points made in the original letter uh, uh, are addressed which is to uh, ha seek an urgent meeting um, and to uh, and to discuss 
um, ways in which um, Westminster and uh, Holyrood could work together on this. And indeed, that will include Cardiff as well, since all of the targets within the UK are linked. And, you know, we, we were given a proposed target of net zero by 2045, but it was quite explicitly stated in the Climate Committee for Climate Change advice that that would necessitate there being changes taking place at the Westminster level. Um, so our, our ability to achieve the target is dependent on Westminster um, doing what is necessary, um, and that's what I need to speak to them urgently about. Okay, thank you. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you very much, convener. Um, the bill that's before us is essentially about changing the numbers in the 2009 Act. Mm. Uh, the 2009 Act has quite a lot of policy uh, I initiatives and requirements in it. Uh, in uh, making, as you said, uh, Cabinet Secretary, uh, climate change at the heart of the next spending review and programme for government is part of that um, which would be within your responsibility uh, to look at to how well we're actually doing on the other parts of the 2009 Act, besides simply the numbers? Um, well, we're already doing some of that. It's not something that's uh, not already happening. I mean, I, I think one of the things that we're uh, uh, already doing uh, is uh, um, reviewing the public body's reporting duties. So that's something that uh, um, was set out under uh, the 2009 Act. Um, and uh, I, I, I don't believe at the moment that things like climate change adaptation and changes to those parts of the Act would be particularly helpful. So, you know, we're looking at the aspects of the Act that we, we think are appropriate to be looked at, but we're not really looking at it overall because we've taken the targets issue and to, we're re-legislating on the targets issue. We've got some aspects of it under review, um, but we're not looking at it um, as a, a single act that is under review. So there will remain parts of it which are still relevant. Um, uh, and if necessary, we will go back to that. But it's not at the moment something that we have got planned. Well, uh, given that uh, the whole thrust of what the government is trying to do is to mainstream it, we'll, we're going to another questions talk about how ministers and so on respond to that. Uh, so I'm not asking about that. Uh, but uh, there are policy, I, I just choose two at random out of the 2009 Act, which I guess are uh, with Derek Mackay as finance minister, for example, in relation to uh, uh, local rates and what is charged and business rates. Oh, there are other examples. So, so are there resources that you're aware of uh, as Cabinet Secretary that have been devoted in other areas of responsibility uh, to look at uh, bits of the 2009 Act that are relevant to other ministers? Well, I've just you know, delivered a statement in Parliament about a huge one, which was deposit return, which was sure. uh, um, uh, um, flagged up in the 2009 Act, and we've been able to use the... Um, uh, the provisions in the 2009 Act to do deposit return by um, uh, secondary legislation and not have to go through primary legislation. Yep. So, you know, there, there, there are things that are already uh, being uh, um, taken forward. We're looking across a whole range of responsibilities, um, uh, as I indicated, to look at the things that are working and increase action where necessary. And that does, does look at the issue of resourcing uh, uh, across the piece. Um, but, uh, uh, um, you know, um, that, that will be part and parcel of the exercise that we have to conduct now um, uh, uh, in, the, in the more recent changed circumstances. Mark Ruskell. Yeah, I understand there's work happening in housing as well, so I, I'm, I'm less across the detail of other people's portfolios, so, um, um, but I understand that there's, there's good work being done in housing too. Thank you. Mark Ruskell. Yeah, I mean, it seems that one of the main ways that the government has to build that collective responsibility is through the Cabinet Subcommittee on Climate Change. It, how many times has that met in the last year? It meets as and when necessary. Um, off the top of my head, I can't remember how many times it's met in the last year, but it's met fairly just within the last uh, few weeks. It met uh, because of the advent of Stage 2 um, and uh, uh, the, the amendment process. 
um, uh, it, is a, it is a business committee. It's not a sitting around um, chewing the fat committee. I, I don't want people to misunderstand what the, the reality of the cabinet, cabinet subcommittee is. So it doesn't have a regular uh, scheduled program of meetings as if it was the cabinet. It meets as and when it's necessary in order to take decisions uh, that are delegated to it from the cabinet. Mm -hmm. So in terms of... Um changes that have come as a result of that committee make, uh, meeting. You know, have there been discussions around budget? Have there been discussions around uh, policies in other cabinet ministers' portfolios that have changed as a result of, of those discussions in light of the bill? Uh, well, a number of the, well, the most recent meeting was about uh, uh, what could reasonably be expected at stage two, and there's a number of um, different portfolios uh, represented. Uh, um, previous meetings have discussed um, a range of things um, and uh, um, particularly in the early stages and throughout the process of the climate change plan development um, uh, those were very live discussions about some of the um, some of the things that from portfolio perspectives um, were considered to be you know more or less achievable um, uh, and that's an important part of the discussion because obviously I'm not able to make a decision on behalf of another uh, uh, cabinet secretary and they will need to come uh, and advise whether or not a potential target in the specific area is or is not an achievable one. Um, that's the kind of discussion that, that, that happens. But it, it can be quite wide-ranging or depending on the point <coughs> at which we're having the meeting, it can be quite narrow. So it depends really on the purpose of the meeting. As I said, it's not a... It's not a discussion meeting that is had on a regular basis. It, it, the meetings are called to deal with, a spe with specific issues. Mm. So in terms of the um, First Minister's policy review that she announced um, a couple of weeks ago, is that something that the Cabinet Subcommittee is now working on? Uh, and how can no, Parliament then scrutinise no, what comes out of it? Cabinet secretaries and the senior officials in portfolios will already be working on that. That's, that is not something that, that the Cabinet Subcommittee works on. That is not the kind of thing that uh, uh, the, the Cabinet Subcommittee um, will be doing at this stage. It is a matter for um, relevant Cabinet Secretaries, Ministers and their senior uh, officials um, to take forward. Um, and at the point at which um, all of that then begins to come in, there may be a decision at that point whether or not another Cabinet Subcommittee is required or not or whether, in fact, it's perhaps a full cabinet. I mean, these are not my decisions, so it's a... Mm. It's a so how does Parliament deal with the outcome for these, from these discussions? Because when you stand up in the chamber, with due respect, to ask you a question about budget, you're not able to answer that. So it does, pr pr you know, it does um, present a challenge to Parliament about how we scrutinise the, the kind of joined-up discussions around policy that are taking place. Well, as far as I'm aware, you can ask to speak to any... Um, cabinet secretary um, and if you have specific questions you know they they will answer them you've had Derek Mackay here you've had Mike Russell here I think you've had Fergus Ewing here as well and, and there you know you have the capacity to to ask very detailed policy questions if you ask me very detailed policy questions and I haven't had advance notice I will be able to give you some information, but I won't be able to give you the level of information which, uh, which my colleagues would be able to give you because I'm not the Cabinet Secretary for everything. Mm -hmm. okay. Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary, and good morning to your team. Uh, could I take us back uh, briefly to the 2009 Act? And uh, you referred um, to Deposit Return Scheme as an example of what was in that Act and that enabled there to be secondary legislation um, for what um, uh, I and others are very supportive of in, in, in terms of, uh, of DRS. Um, would you agree that there's a case for uh, the possibility of putting down policy markers in a similar way in, in, the, in the act that we're scrutinising at the moment? Well, that's a matter for the parties to think about. I mean, I, I, you know, we'll be looking at um, anything that we wish to put down at stage two, um, I'm aware that uh, uh, other people will have other ideas. Uh, I, can't, I can't speak because I wasn't directly involved in the negotiations around what was and was not agreed in terms of the 2009 Act, so it will be a matter for um, uh, members to, to think about whether or not uh, they consider something to be appropriate to be brought forward. 
Um, uh, I, I just remind everybody that in terms of um, uh, deposit return, the, the 2009 legislation didn't mandate that there would be a deposit return no. system. What it said was that it would, you know, there would be a kind of opening if, if, if at some point that's what was considered to be appropriate. Now, there's been a lot of work on deposit return. It has actually been discussed over a long period of time. Um, and uh, I think it probably will have benefited from being given that space to do that. Um, uh, I mean, from our perspective, um, I, I'm strongly of the view, uh, we set out in terms of this bill, that this bill should be about focusing on the targets um, uh, in response to the Paris Agreement. Um, I don't believe we need to start all over again in terms of the 2009 Act. We're not repealing the 2009 Act with, with this piece of legislation. We're changing the targets. So that's a different... Uh, a, a, a different I'm sorry if that's what the implication of what I said was. That wasn't what I was trying to say, actually, Cabinet Secretary. N no, sorry. but I mean, I, you, know, we, you know, our hope yeah. was that people would, would get on with this bill in terms of the targets, because that's the important thing that we need to be doing right now. Um, and in my view, the climate change plan is probably the best place to be dealing with individual delivery mechanisms, and that's the appropriate point at which all of that should be uh, discussed. Um, and as we've already indicated, we're prepared to update the climate change plan within six months of royal assent. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Camina. Um, during our discussions as committee uh, on the bill, um, we were somewhat exercised by the Times model, which the government has been using, um, and reflected that in a report. And the government said uh, in its response to our report, they're working to improve the consistency with which sectors are dealt with through Times. Now, I make the observation that quite a lot of it was that it didn't properly address agriculture. Uh, John Scott and myself will return to the subject of agriculture later, so I'm not specifically targeting that. However, the Climate Change Committee have developed their own scenario and sectorial analysis, essentially their own multiple models. And I, I just wonder now uh, where the government stands in relation to th their future use of models. Will you seek to access the Climate Change Committee models, if it's correct to describe them as models? I is to add, um, or will you persist in using the Times approach, which the committee identified had some gaps in its coverage that left us a bit concerned? Well, I think from our perspective, uh, although the CCC isn't using the Times model itself, and, and people need to remember that the Times model is not specific only to Scotland. I mean, there, you know, it is a, it is a, it is a well understood. Uh, process that it's in used, you know, used in a number of different places. CCC is using something um, slightly different, but it basically does provide a, a fairly similar um, uh, representation of the whole system. Um, and in that sense, it achieves pretty much similar results. From our perspective, um, we believe Times is still a key element of um, the whole analysis um, and modelling for you know, which underpins our um, approach to climate change. Um, and, and as I indicated, it's not just used by Scotland, it's used throughout the world. So we have then, by using it, we have the benefit of there being a consistency internationally, uh, um, which if we start randomly inventing our own system, we don't have. Um, uh, it's accompanied by other th analysis though, and, uh, and I suspect that that's perhaps not so well understood um, because it's not the whole story. So we also uh, um, have used the Scottish Electricity Dispatch Model, the Scottish Heat Map, National Housing Model, um, the Transport Model for Scotland and the Scottish Government Heat Model. So there are other models and analyses that are uh, used alongside it. Um, what we do with times is look at the interaction between all of these um, and make sure we have an overall plan um, that makes sense. So I recall from uh, a couple of years ago um, some heated discussions about um, uh, different models. You know, you, if you try to move to a model that, say, reduces dependence on gas heating um, uh, and set a target for the likes of 2025 in order to do something along those lines, what 
what would be the knock-on effect then? What would that look like if you tried to do that in one sector, and then and then looked uh, and looked at the impact on uh, uh, on other sectors? That's what time is important for. It's allowing us to be able to assess that, you know, that impact right across the sector because there are implications for what what you choose to do. I mean, that if you go, for example, too fast on reduction in uh, the use of gas central heating, even supposing you could set in place the ability to do it as quickly as you might want to, do you even have enough gas plumbers to do it? So these are real questions that underlie some of the ideas that emerge and have got to be thought about um, and worked through. That process has got to be thought about and worked through. And that goes back to the conversation about well, what is actually achievable and, and what might not be achievable um, and what timescales are appropriate for these things. Can I, can I um, sure. Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, um, just on the similarity between the approach that we take in Scottish Government and that the CCC use it, and you, you're right that they're different, but they're similar in an important way, and that is that they're based on sector-level analysis and sector-level evidence that then gets brought together. Um, within Scottish Government, we bring that together in times for them to, to look at the interactions that the Cabinet Secretary was explaining. And the CCC have a different thing that brings it all together to look at the interactions, which clearly I'm less familiar with. But it's the same sort of basic system of sector-level evidence and then looking at the interactions. And the point that you raise about agriculture and transport are absolutely right, that they haven't been integrated into times to look at those interactions so well to date, and that's something that we're working on actively. And hopefully, in time for the update to the plan, um, those um, interactions will be um, properly established within the times model. If not for the update, then definitely for the next full plan. And it should be said that the analysis from the various CCC feeds goes into times as well. So there is an interaction. We're not, we're not sitting running completely separately. Um, uh, and times is not static. So it does get improved and worked on. So it's not a, it's not a static um, model um, that, is, that is dated to a particular time when it was developed. Right. That's fine. Um, I, I got a description, I think, of what economists would describe as second and third level effects. You know, are there enough plumbers uh, to redo the gas system if you change the gas that you're using? Um, and, and clearly that uh, is going to be important as you develop policy that is responding to <clears throat> the agenda. But I just wonder that one of the ch differences that the Climate Change Committee put before us between what they're doing and what Times does is that Times seeks to provide a single answer. And what they suggested was that their approach provides multiple options. Now, I'm unclear, and perhaps you could help me, uh, whether that is the difference between the shorter term, say, 10-year horizon of developing policy and the 30-year or so uh, tw now 25 year horizon that takes us to the end targets. Are there different approaches for these two parts of what needs to be done to set targets for, for example, 2045? I don't think so, but I can't confidently answer that question. I think we would need to um, have an economist here um, much more familiar with the modeling to answer that. So maybe that's something we could get back to you on. But but the times, you know, the, 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 the description I was talking about, that kind of conversation about, uh, you know, the times modelling in respect of if you, if you choose a, um, a way of doing it, what will that look like? What will the on, you know, that, that led to one particular proposal being rejected and another one being run through. So it's not a, it, it, in, in the sense that it's, not, you know, one, it comes out with one answer. It's not just quite as simple as that because it, it shows you what the implications are of making a decision. So you can see uh, if, the, if the on cost, and I don't mean cost just in terms of money here, but if the mm. on cost of that decision is going to become extremely mm. difficult to manage, then, then, you, you, then you will choose a different way of approaching it. So it's, the Times model isn't just a, well, here it is, and that's it. That, that's not how it works. I mean, and I'm not an expert on Times, I have to say. Um, uh, and it isn't just feeding 
a bunch of information in one end and waiting five hours for the computer to spit it out the other end. It's not as simple as that either. But it's, you know, it does, it, it does enable you to assess uh, um, scenarios. Um, and, and that's the, you know, the, the benefit of the, of the whole economy, the whole sort of economy approach as well, because it, you're, you're testing all the time what the impacts are going to be in other areas. And if you don't do that, then what is required from other areas? Um, you know, so, so that, that, you know, was a, that was a, a I mean, the, the example I used was a discussion and, you know, was something that Times was, you know, used to look at, but was something that was rejected because it was actually in, probably in deliverability terms, going to be almost impossible to physically deliver. Well, let me finally just then say, um, you've just used the word scenarios in the context of times and putting scenarios in and seeing what that tells you. Um, the Climate Change Committee are telling us they've developed their own scenarios. And I, I just simply would like to know if you are cited on them and if you're not currently cited on the detail of this. And I, Across the no, detail no. of the Climate Change Committee's particular analyses. We use the information that they develop and we will help. I mean, it's helpful for us to feed it in, but I can't answer questions about the climate change analysis. No, no, I wasn't seeking to have you do that because I shared what you've just said as an expectation. I was merely seeking to say, will you take further steps at official level, I suspect, well, the ministerial level, uh, to have sight of their scenarios simply to help inform the decisions we will make here? I'm not Oh, I, I can put this question to them, but my understanding is that the scenarios are set out in the reports that they've just published. All right, okay. Um, I will need to read it more carefully, then, um, and I apologise. Cr cr crucially, and you, you, you may not realise this respect, respectfully, that there's, there's two reports. Um, there's, the, there's the main headline report, mm. and then there's a, an additional 300-page report, the technical oh, detail. Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, John Scott. Um, good morning. Um, just a brief supplementary about the times and modelling, and I was interested in what Sarah Granger said about um, how that would essentially take in agriculture and transport, you hoped at any rate, for the development of the climate change plan in due course. Uh, will that take into account peatland as well, since it seems to be the huge variable, or yet another variable, in all of this, or a wild card in all of this, will it be able to incorporate that into the Times modelling and the restoration of peatland? Um, yes, I think the answer is yes. Restoration of peatland um, is, I, th I think I'm correct in saying it's already part of the um, Times model. Um, if you're referring to the revisions to the peatland data that are, are coming, um, I think it will be very important to incorporate that into the analysis that's done when we update the plan. And it's capable of doing that. Right, thank you. Thank you. All right, Ruskell. Yeah, I think that, that leads us nicely on, actually, to some of the evidence that we, we had last week um, from the Climate Change Committee, uh, particularly around interim targets in 2030. Um, there does seem to be uh, continued uncertainty, particularly in relation to, to peatland, um, and what emissions may be coming from that. And it's clear that some of that cannot be bottomed out until the UK also look at the issue in relation to their next carbon budget. Um, I mean, given that, would it not be sensible to set interim and longer term targets now based on the current inventory that we have uh, on the basis that potentially that could be revised down if uh, estimations of what, what peatland contributes um, are revised in the years ahead. I'm sorry, what are you suggesting? Because we've already accepted the CCC advice on the interim targets for 2030 and 2040. Are you suggesting that we depart from that advice? Um, I think we had a very useful clarification from the CCC yesterday that came into the committee in the form of a letter which suggested that based on the current inventory as it stands today, uh, that the targets would be different, um, potentially 76% by 2030, for example. So obviously if we, if we change the inventory, um, 
then the targets would be less. So I just wonder if, you, if you've seen that analysis, if you've thought about that. Because right. there clearly are two options. I haven't seen that letter, Tom. Yeah. I think you've, you've seen that. Uh, I have indeed. Um, so, as the Cabinet Secretary has said, the CCC's recommendations on targets were set out in their advice letter, uh, sorry, in the initial uh, main advice report. Um, what, as I understand it, the, yeah, the further letter that the CCC Secretary provided is yeah, exploring this question about the, yeah, how expectations around future inventory revisions are, are factored into the advice they've provided, but that letter doesn't change in any way the advice they've provided and which the government has, has acted upon. So on the substantial question of do we follow the CCC's advice, I would obviously defer entirely to the Cabinet Secretary. Just uh, as a further, I guess it's, it's an observation on what I understand as being suggested as a potential alternative. The government certainly of the view that it's important that targets offer clear and stable signals and aren't changed more than is necessary. So this is something we've we heard a lot from stakeholders, especially from businesses when we were preparing the bill at the outset, the, the importance of the signaling function of, of targets. And to our mind, that means it's very important that we use the best, the best evidence that's available now in terms of setting those targets. And the, the CCC have been clear in their advice that they consider that best evidence to be the inventory as it now stands, plus the things that we know are coming into the inventory in the next couple of years. So we, we know, um, as a matter of certainty, insofar as anything around the inventory can ever be certain, that the IPCC wetland supplement, which is the peatland revisions, is going to be implemented within the next three years because the UK government has made international commitments that will happen. The UK government's published a uh, substantial scientific report about what the implications in numerical terms for the inventory of that uh, implementation will be. The CCC have reflected those expectations in their advice on, on the targets. Uh, and if I can just quote what Chris Stark said to the committee, I think, uh, on the 14th of May, it is that in terms of all the targets, we have offered you the best assessment of the evidence as it now stands. And the government's view is to follow that that best best assessment. Does that help? A, a little. Uh, does that represent a shift then in the CCC's thinking? Because back in 2017, uh, they recommended setting the targets on the basis of current inventories, freezing those for five years in order to assess against against targets. So I there have, is still I'm, uncertainty. I'm, I'm sorry, you're asking me about what I mean. The, the CCC's thinking. What we have is the report they delivered to us, and the advice in that report has been accepted by us. If you're asking me to go somehow behind that report into an area about which I'm afraid I can't answer questions, which is what effectively internally the CCC might be thinking about things, other than what is written down isn't, is, is, is somewhere I cannot go. I, I, you're asking me a question that I don't believe I can answer, or any of us can answer. Okay. John Scott? Yes. Um, Cabinet Secretary, notwithstanding what you've just said, and notwithstanding the fact that you partly have not cited of Chris Stark's letter of yesterday, which essentially said that 70% where was the interim target, he's essentially said yesterday that, that actually means 76%, and that 90% equals 96%. Okay. Well... Um, <laughs> there's some dispute here as to well, and this there is, is certainly it's it's open to interpretation. And what I wanted to know is, were you aware of the contents of what this letter was likely to be when you lodged the amendments of, uh, proposing the new targets? Because I clean the, forgot my crystal ball. So no, I was not aware of a letter that was going to be delivered on 20th of May when I lodged the amendments on the 2nd of May. So, you know, there really isn't very much more I can say than that. And, and, you know, it is unfortunate that the letter has appeared after you've had the CCC in front of you to ask these questions. Um, um, and, and it has arrived quite late in terms of us being able to go back to the CCC to get some 
further clarification to ensure that what we read is what we believe we're reading, which may now be the issue. Um, but at the moment, those are not questions I can actually answer. As far as I understand it, and I haven't read the letter, as far as I understand it, the, 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 what, what the CCC is basically, has basically said is that the 70% that they're advising us for 2030, if they've already taken into account the future revisions, when they're assessing that 70%. So they're already, because they're aware of all the conversation, and so are we, of course, because part of the bill, uh, uh, which you know, is going to be passed, part of the bill that we're, we're talking about actually has a section which, which deals with the fact that these revisions are going to make a pretty significant impact on our, uh, our results, and there's a, there's a handling mechanism designed in the bill precisely for that. So what the CCC is saying is if they set us this 70% target and we accept it, in effect, it's the equivalent of a reduction of 76% if we were sticking to the current way of accounting in terms of land use. But we know we're not going to be able to stick to that current way of accounting. We know that there are big changes coming in. So, so my guess is what the Committee for Climate Change effectively has done is has already kind of taken that into their thinking, and that's where they've come up with the 70%. So it would look like 76% if the, none of those revisions were going to happen. And no doubt if they didn't have any idea about those revisions, they'd have set us 76% for 2030. Yeah, but we are in a position where we all know that these revisions are taking place. We know because we've got sections of the bill which deal with that very issue um, and which I have to say that prior to lodging the bill, we thought were going to be controversial and they've not turned out to be controversial at all, perhaps to the point where everybody's actually forgotten about them, but they are there in the bill. And, and so they're there in the bill. We're kind of working on that basis. Uh, Committee for Climate Change is working on that basis as well. Okay. I'm still a little unclear on that, but perhaps if there was further reflections on both the letter and your views on it, you might wish to write to us if, if, if you could explain it more clearly, because it's just too complicated for me. We, have, happily, um, we can happily provide a, a letter. Um, the, the key issue is that the CCC have considered all of the relevant evidence in advising on the targets. The letter they provided in response to a specific question said what, the, what they would have advised had they excluded some evidence. Um, I think it's right that they consider all the evidence and that we set targets based on their advice, based on all of the evidence, and not decide to, to remove some sections of the evidence to get a different result, that we would know we would have to then come back with secondary legislation within three years, if not sooner, to amend. Can we move on to questions from Angus MacDonald? OK, thanks. Um, can we, if I could turn to something uh, a bit less uh, complicated with regard to cross-departmental approaches. Um, now, uh, Chris Stark told his committee last week that it was not acceptable that the CCC was the only organisation addressing uh, decarbonisation in detail uh, at UK level. So um, can I ask what discussions have taken place with Bayes and other UK government departments about mainstreaming climate change policy? Well, um, since most of this has devolved, our interactions with um, uh, the UK government tend to be about specific issues. So there's a detailed interaction around UK ETS uh, um, uh, um, rather than a bigger conversation about mainstreaming climate change policy. Um, uh, as the committee is aware, I have written two bays um, uh, on the back of the CCC advice to... Uh, Westminster and the devolved administrations um, uh, because I think what is now needed urgently is that we begin to have the kinds of conversations that might be uh, subsumed under the idea of mainstreaming uh, climate change policy um, uh, because if we, if we have not got um, everybody in the UK working to the same 
ambition, then we won't achieve what we're hoping to achieve. And I'm, you know, I, I remain optimistic that the government at Westminster, you know, whatever it looks like over the next few weeks and months, will nevertheless regard this as a continuing uh, and major issue that, that needs to be uh, that needs to be discussed. Um, from our perspective, I suppose the difficulty is that they can choose to simply go on doing whatever it is they're doing without much reference to us. It is quite clear from the Committee for Climate Change's advice that if we want to reach the ambition that we want to get to, then we need to be, we need to be doing it in, in concert with them and they need to be taking actions that, you know, uh, uh, I, I don't know whether they're ready to take or not. Um, and my guess right now at UK government level is that minds are not actually on this right now. Um, so while we're doing this and we've got a bill that's already in place and we've got, you know, we've got all of this process uh, underway, that's not where the UK government currently is. And I, I, can't, I can't force them into a position that they're not at present ready to take. Okay. Um would you say that there is any way that the Scottish um, government could influence uh, the integration of, of climate policy across the whole of the UK? Well, can I be just, you know, when you're talking about the integration of climate policy, just remember that most of this is, is devolved. And what I don't want is a situation set up where we lose the accountability and the control and the decision making from Scotland. So um, uh, I think there is a bit of be careful what you wish for when it comes to using the words integration. Um, uh, what we have to do is is, is work uh, uh, alongside Cardiff and Westminster in this respect to make sure that we're all heading in the same direction, uh, in the right direction. Um, uh, uh, the, I mean, in terms of whether or not I can bounce Westminster, I don't really think I can. The CCC and Lord Debon, you know, frequently make it very clear that that we are being more ambitious, that, that we are in the lead on this and that, and that we are a model which Westminster and Cardiff should be looking at. But I can't, I can't mandate other governments um, and I can only do what I have done, which is invite these early conversations for us to be able to take this forward uh, in, in a way that's um, much more uh, urgent than has been, taken, has been the, the case up until now. Okay, thanks. John, did you have a specific question on this um, theme? I was probably just going to... Well, on that theme, and I'll move on to my own question, with your permission, convener. Um, just, uh, I appreciate the awkwardness of what you're saying, um, Cabinet Secretary. Just how dependent is the Scottish Government, though, notwithstanding the devolved um, nature of our responsibilities, just how dependent are we on... Um, the Scottish government actually coming, uh, the UK government actually coming to a view on this. Well, um, I, I think in my, uh, um, I think in my in my statement, I tried to uh, lay out some of the, the the decisions that are being made at a UK government level, or indeed in some cases not being made at a UK government level, uh, that will hinder us. I mean, the the Committee for Climate Change, I think. Uh, highlighted a, a, a huge one, which is the uh, taking forward carbon capture and storage. Um, and, uh, uh, and that continues to be uh, um, an, an, an issue uh, if that's not taken forward, because it was quite clear from the CCC advice that that is absolutely necessary now to be taken forward. Um, so, the, the, so there is one. Um, I, I flagged up uh, in respect of one issue that I had picked up on the day of the statement, which was that the um, VAT rate on uh, solar panels was going to be increased from 5% to 20%. Um, and in fact, uh, uh, although I didn't, uh, uh, I only knew about solar panels, in fact, on, on uh, further investigation, that decision to jump uh, VAT from 5 to 20%, um, and it will be uh, brought into place on 1st of October 2019, um, is not just about solar panels, it's for a whole host of renewable technologies, including solar, wind, biomass and heat pumps. Well, if you're trying to get people to actually take these things up, whether in domestic settings or uh, any other settings, jumping the VAT from 5% to 20% is going to have the absolutely opposite impact to what you want. 
Um, so there's another example of the kind of thing which we have no control over, but nevertheless will have a very distinctive impact on decision making at the level of, of quite ordinary people who are hoping to be able to do the right thing. Um, uh, so, I, you know, there are, there are a whole load of other um, specific ones. I don't know if you really want me to go through them all. Um, uh, but, you know, the, the whole issue of vehicle taxation and all the rest of it is also reserved. So there's another whole area that we are unable to effect change. Um, so if we're trying to do things, we're, having to, we're limited in where we can do it and how we can do it. Um, Decarbonising the gas grid is a matter entirely for the UK government. Um, and it goes back to the discussion that we had earlier about, in practical terms, how do you, 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 you kind of manage the, 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 the heating issue in, in domestic um, and business mm -hmm. properties? Um, well, the other side of that is decarbonising the gas grid. Um, and, and if that's not going to happen, if that's not getting taken forward, there's a big blockage there. So these are the kinds of things that the CCC is talking about that actually will inhibit us from reaching our 2045 target, which would otherwise be possible if we could get the UK government to, 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 to do that. So there are more, but I'm sure you don't want me to list That's them. enough to be going on with. <laughs> Although if you want to send us an exhaustive list, I'm sure you We can try, but I, I mean, I don't can know I how exhaustive in, the list would be. Can I bring in Stuart Stevenson a very brief supplementary? I, I, I just note press comment that British Steel uh, have applied to the UK government for £100 million to cover the period 29th March to 31st of October and their inability to participate fully in the emissions trading scheme. And I wonder if, well, clearly that's nothing particularly to do with Scotland, um, but, but it's an example of how the emissions trading scheme operation, which I gather is at least a quarter of what goes on in the whole issue in terms of numbers and uncertainty on that um, is that there is a policy and practical lacuna. Um, now, of course, it may be that British Steel have other reasons related to the business performance for asking for 100 million, but they are hanging it on that hook. And I wonder if that's, uh, in general terms, uh, something that the government and officials in the government are looking at. Um, well, yes, very actively, the UK ETS, uh, the, the EU ETS is, a, is, is an active discussion, and in fact, is currently um, there is a consultation out there, and the committee might wish to go and have a look at that because um, uh, actually that is devolved. Um, and we've choose to, you know, the, the, the emissions trading is just that Scotland as a market is not big enough to really make it in practical terms, which is why, from our perspective. Uh, uh, we think staying in the EU ETS is the most important, is the best way to do. And if we're not going to stay in the EU ETS, then what we need is a UK ETS that is linked to the EU ETS. So, so there's an active live consultation right now, which effectively we are a part of. Um, uh, um, and and it is the the uncertainty around ETS is causing more than British Steel some concerns. Um, it's causing a lot of businesses some. Uh, some real concern because the, the, the future is uncertain. Um, and if we're on a no deal Brexit, we will overnight switch to a carbon tax, which then removes that whole devolved accountability and, and, and scrutiny from us because it will be an entirely treasury led um, exercise, which uh, is Not really on, on the face of it. Uh, intended to only be a, a, a temporary fix, but I fear that once the Treasury gets an, a hold of it, that it might end up being a very long temporary fix. Back to you, John. Thank you, uh, convener. And I should have declared an interest already as a, as a farmer and a landowner, but I'll do so now. Um, my question, um, um, Cabinet Secretary, uh, around agriculture, and how can a, a truly multifunctional land use strategy be put in place? In other words, how do we get from the Climate Change Committee advice to detailed policy delivery in agriculture? Um, with a lot of very hard work and a great deal of talking to uh, a variety of different interests to uh, ensure that they are uh, uh, coming along with us. And I mean, obviously, um, uh, revisiting of some of the agriculture uh, proposals will be required when we do the the revision of the climate change plan that we've agreed to do. Um, I've already been in conversation with um, 
uh, with some of the uh, uh, with with the NFUS actually because I I wanted to make sure that they had seen the um, vivid economics um, research that was commissioned by WWF because I thought that was a very helpful and constructive um, uh, contribution uh, to everything and gave uh, perhaps um, rather more comfort to the agriculture sector than than they might have been feeling uh, about this um, up until now. Um, they are uh, very much aware of the role they have to play, um, but uh, you know the, the the thing is to actually uh, have them understand the enormous contribution that they they have to make. And I and I noticed that the Committee for Climate Change, for example, did foresee a continuing healthy livestock sector in Scotland. And I know that's been a matter for of some concern for. Um, a number of parts of our agriculture sector. Well, absolutely, I'm declaring an absolute interest in that <laughs> regard again. But, I mean, what can be done to ensure that trees are planted and peatlands restored at the necessary rate and to the required levels? And how can that be done without affecting too much traditional land use? I mean, do you... Well, that's always the that's always the question because the you, you know I, I I use an analogy and I often say it in different quarters that if you've got a an acre of acre of land that acre of land you know is expected to grow trees grow food uh, produce food um, provide us with flood protection have a house built on it do you know it, we 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 put an enormous burden on on land and there are a massive number of competing. Uh, competing priorities. Um, so the, the, the issue really is to establish um, the best use for particular um, for particular land. Um, and the majority of Scotland's land, of course, is is of of it's basically I don't want to use the word poor, but it's not it's not land which is going to be able to be used for um, a great many other things. You can't switch from if you're a hill farmer, you can't suddenly switch to arable because that's not going to be within your within your gift. So it's it's getting the right decision in the right area. Um, I, I mean, these are tricky matters because there are other aspects at play here, and I am conscious of the concern amongst the agriculture sector about seeing um, land go out of agricultural use and and effectively being planted up with trees in, instead of agriculture use. So, you know, there are there are all sorts of issues in and around in and around that um, that are also about how far as a government you can prohibit or mandate certain uses for land. Um, and there are other restrictions there, you know, because at that point the lawyers then become concerned about what you how far you can and cannot um, intervene in specific decisions that are made about a specific piece of land. Quite. Not wishing to blindside you at all, but just make a suggestion um, that um, came out of discussions I've been involved in that should, would you consider developing a new um, class of land, a new land class? At the moment you have class one arable land, class two land, class three land. And maybe we should be looking as an innovative way of approaching this um, problem um, of developing a, a climate change mitigate, mitigation land class, which top of that land class would be peat, peat bog restoration and subsequent would be forestry. And that land class might then attract a value um, for those who wish to use it um, to offset their organisation's responsibility towards um, carbon mitigation. I, I just offer the thought to you. I'm happy to discuss it with you further. Well, I, I, it wouldn't be a, a conversation just for myself alone anyway. It would no, be one for Fergus Ewing as well. And, and you know, we would you know, look at all um, ideas. But I, I just go back to some of the points at which you then run into, whether people like it or not, ECHR issues about actual ownership and, and, and things. And if you, you know, you're, you're, you're presuming that a, a landowner or a farmer or whoever might consider that that field attracts more value if it's designated in that way, that farmer might be thinking, actually, I'd rather sell that field for housing um, 
um, in which case, sorry, your offer isn't going to cut it. So there are, the, the, you know, there are lots of conversations to be had around that, and they, uh, you would need to really work through very carefully um, unintended consequences of, of, of that kind of reclassification. Um, I mean, it's certainly a conversation that uh, I think is worth having, but whether or not it would necessarily result in what you're suggesting is another matter entirely. After all, we do already give grants and money to things like peatland restoration and uh, and what have you. So it's a it's a you know it, it's not as if we're not already doing some of that. No, I, I I agree. I think it could just develop a hierarchy of subclasses within that climate change I, mitigation I, class okay. of land. But I appreciate what you yeah. say too about ECHR. And I'm well aware of the pitfalls of that historically that this parliament has has fallen into. So we wouldn't necessarily want to go down that road at all. Um, so thank you for that. Um, I, I think that's me finished. Um, I'm going to take a brief supplementary from Mark Ruscon. I was wondering, the Cabinet Secretary, we, we um, are getting on fine with our questions we want to ask. Would you welcome a, a five-minute break after this question? If, you, if you're yeah. happy in terms yeah. of time, that's okay. fine. Thanks. Mark. Um, I think John Scott makes a very interesting suggestion, but there's maybe just a, a broader point here about making sure that climate change mitigation is at the heart of farm subsidy financial support going forward. Is that a discussion that you've had in the Cabinet subcommittee or in Cabinet or in bilaterals with Mr Ewing? Well, I have a lot of discussions with um, uh, with Fergus Ewing about um, uh, all aspects of both portfolios, um, as you would expect, um, and uh, you know we are well aware um, of some of the issues that uh, uh, might emerge. Um, uh, there hasn't been a cabinet subcommittee uh, since the one that we did in terms of coming preparation for stage two. Um, that's not necessarily where that discussion would be located. Um, our senior officials are probably, as we speak, thinking along some of the lines um, that are being discussed, at least insofar as they need to be considered before they can be discarded, if they have to be discarded, but they need to be considered. And we are trying to now consider absolutely everything. But you know, these, these decisions will be made effectively, ultimately, by Cabinet. Take a brief suspension.
Okay. Uh, welcome back to the Environment and Climate Change meeting. Um, we'll move on to questions from Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, Convener. And Cabinet Secretary, could I turn our minds to the co-benefits and multi-benefits that are, are possible from um, what we're scrutinising from the um, lowering of um, the greenhouse gas emissions. And um, as you'll know, our committee stated in its report, and I quote, that we would welcome a model that highlights the significant additional and secondary benefits to, among other things, health, industry and employment. And uh, we made a few requests in, in that um, report. And uh, I was heartened to, um, to see the Scottish Government stage one response noted, and I quote again, that um, it would be happy to engage in further discussions with the committee and the CCC about the potential to further develop the analytical approach to assessing the impacts of mitigating and adapting to climate change uh, and the additional and secondary benefits to, among other things, health, industry and employment. And I wonder, Cabinet Secretary, if you could give us um, an update on any, um, any developments in, in those areas of research and um, not least, I think there's a Strathclyde University um, research project ongoing. But, but more, more broadly, any engagement that has been had with the CCC or developments from Scottish Government? Well, um, I think I've already indicated in the letter that I sent to the committee last week that we are going to bring forward stage two amendments to require that future climate change plans do include cost benefit estimates uh, to be delivered by each of the policies set out. So, you know, but, but I need to be very clear that that is future climate change plans because the methodologies wouldn't be available to do it in the six month rehash of the existing climate change plan. The time scale for that would be too short um, because it does take um, a fair amount of, uh, it will take a fair amount of work and uh, thinking. Um, I, I think it's, it's, it's going to be a really vital part for all governments to do this because up until now, most of the actions that have gotten us to where we are in terms of climate change mitigation haven't really impacted directly on ordinary people, but we're now moving into a scenario where actually that is going to happen. So being able to very clearly outline co-benefits and make, make that very clear uh, um, tying together uh, is, uh, is something that, that from our perspective, all governments are really uh, going to have to do. So there have been uh, a number of uh, conversations uh, with enterprise agencies and the investment bank um, uh, just to look at the state of low carbon investment and identify future funding interventions um, and look at uh, innovation. So there are, um, uh, there are in some areas quite uh, deep conversations taking, uh, taking place, and the investment bank is, is, uh, is one of those. Uh, so uh, some of that work is already uh, actually taking place, but as I indicated, if, if we're going to look at common approaches and methodologies, it's going to take us a little time to work through all of that. Some of them are m more obvious than others, and I think that health benefits and you know, we, we see people already drawing the, the lines between air pollution and health. Um, so some, sometimes co-benefits are, uh, are actually more easily uh, explained. It doesn't always mean that everybody agrees on what the solutions will be, but at least in terms of, of people being able to draw the lines between the two, um, I, I think that's uh, 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 important. And we're running a campaign at the moment on food waste, which directly draws a line between food waste and climate change emissions. So, you know, there's a lot of work being done in respect of that. So uh, um, we are already trying to do it quite explicitly in a number of areas, but assessing the actual, uh, you know, impact of that, understanding exactly um, uh, how to cost that is going to take us a little while. I can answer right, the uh, Strathclyde oh, point. Oh. On the, you specifically asked about the Strathclyde project. Um, it's, a, it's, it's, un, it's underway, it's happening, it's progressing. It's going to be um, at least, I think, um, 18 months to two years now before we get the results from that. So it's such a m massive undertaking to um, really um, 
explore fundamental, fundamentally new, um, quite profound methodologies to look at the how the actions necessary to tackle climate change will impact on GDP and economic growth, as opposed to the economic costs of the actions. If you if you see what I mean, so um, it's the, the the work is underway. It's happening, um, but it'll be um, it'll be 18 months to two years before we have any results. Could, could I ask about um, a little more detail on the Scottish National Investment Bank, um, Cabinet Secretary, in relation to what um, discussions have been had? And um, if, if not today, if it, it would be helpful if you could let the committee know what stakeholders have been involved in those discussions as well and how, how they're developing. Well, officials in the, in the programme team and in my portfolio are already um, in frequent discussions um, so that the, uh, the climate priorities of the government are well reflected in terms of the uh, in terms of the of the bank. Um, uh, the bank team have already uh, have also been engaging with the Just Transition Commission um, directly. Um, so there is a, a work stream there um, already uh, already emerging, and I, I believe there's a workshop um, coming off quite yeah, soon with environmental groups. With environmental groups. Via the Just Transition Commission and the bank, so that some of that is already started. Um, uh, there's, there's a, as I understand it, the bank team has has commissioned a report to look at investment around low carbon and climate change initiatives um, to try and assess uh, which markets were the the ones that are most uh, well developed. But I don't have a time scale for that. The, the report's still in development, so I can't say um, uh, when um, that will uh, that will be um, available. Um, and it does it, it is trying to identify existing availability of finance. Um, so so it's it, there is quite a lot of work going on with the bank team, uh, um, and uh, um, and in that respect. Um, because it's 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 still itself a new part of the of the uh, uh, of the scenery, um, it is becoming integrated into all of the conversations that we, we have to be having. Um, uh, uh, so that, in a sense, is, that's work that's already underway. Right. Thank you. And I'll come on shortly to um, a bit more detail on the Just Transition Commission. Um, but could I ask you? Um, if you've got any further detail of um, uh, what the CCC um, highlighted in oral evidence to us, um, uh, that the issue is not only um, just uh, government integration, which of course um, you've already highlighted today, um, but that we have to get better at taking integration out into the community. And you've highlighted Cabinet Secretary one example of that today already. But um, in, in what other ways is Scottish Government... Um, through your, your own department and other departments able to um, communicate um, and ensure um, public buy-in um, in achieving the net zero emissions? Um, well, I've already flagged up um, that uh, we're um, uh, embarking on a programme of engagement over, um, over the summer um, into the autumn, uh, which is explicitly designed to get out there um, to, to look at the the 60-odd the percent of the population that think climate change is a problem but don't necessarily yet have a sense of what that means for them in, in a realistic way, but also to try and reach those, that third of the population that don't regard it as a problem um, because we, we, you know, we've, we've got to think about them um, as, as well. So, um, uh, uh, so that work is, is going to be... Um, that work is going to be uh, is going to be um, starting, um, and uh, the the outcome of that will give us a better sense then of of where people are in reality when they're confronted with some of the actual decisions that that might have to be made. And are you able to give us um, any more details today about how that will be shaped at all? I know it's no. early days, but would, it is would early you then days, be able so to no. write the to the committee no. and let us know how We're looking how at focus developing. groups, we're looking at you know, a variety of different methods to get out there and do that, um, but in detail, um, no. But Not would you be able point. to write to the committee to keep us informed on this? Because obviously engagement's very important, and we've done 
um, considerable amounts of engagement when, ourselves, and to be able to liaise with with yourself is is important. When in there's this a context. formal programme, then we can we'll let the committee know, and you can make a decision about how you go about um, interacting with that. Right, that's helpful. Short um, supplementary from Mark Ruskell on this. Issue. Yeah, the, the climate change committee uh, did highlight dietary change and dietary trends that are already existing um, in society and, and may, it may increase over, over time towards eating less meat. I just wondered if that's something that, that you know, is, is a bit of a taboo subject within government or actually are you considering what actions you can take to, to encourage that dietary choice on both public health grounds but also in terms of climate as well? Well, I hardly think it's a taboo subject, since the, from the public health minister, as far as I can see, um, uh, discusses this on a regular basis and is, you know, looking across the board at um, uh, food-related public health initiatives um, and, uh, and the issue of obesity. Um, uh, but there's an example of when you move from the general, which everybody would agree with, to the particular, um, that people then become very exercised. Um, uh, so you know there is there is an issue about um, uh, about that level of of connection that people might or might not be making um, to these bigger uh, to these bigger issues. Um, uh, you start um, telling people uh, what they will and will not be allowed to eat, um, and you run into very considerable uh, um, resistance. So I think that one has to be has have some care uh, about that conversation. Uh, and I, uh, um, you know, I think we would all of us here probably, um, in theory, um, you know, want to encourage people to eat a lot more fruit and vegetables because Scotland has a very poor record in doing that and it results in all sorts of issues, um, including health issues. Um, but uh, um, you can't force people to do it. Um, and that's where we have to have this conversation to try and fill that space. Claudia. Uh, thank you, Kavina. Um, before we move on to the um, Just Transition uh, Commission, specifically Cabinet Secretary, could I ask you for any comments from your perspective on um, the, the intergenerational justice issue and where that fits um, within the bill, please? Well, I'm not really... I mean... We've declared... And, and are one of the countries now that is, is accepting um, the global climate emergency. Um, uh, and clearly, as part and parcel of that message, that is about safeguarding the planet for future generations. Um, uh, and we're doing, frankly, we're doing that through the bill because this bill e effectively legislates for what are world-leading targets. Um, uh, uh, they're in line with what the CCC calls highest possible ambition, uh, as called for by the Paris Agreement, um, and, and that is how, in a very practical sense, um, we are, in fact, trying to ensure intergener intergenerational justice. Um, and, you know, I, I think from the perspective of Scotland, we have, we have focused very much on practical um, uh, uh, actions. Um, uh, rather than just rhetoric, and, and I think that's where we should be. Um, so intergenerational justice will be met by countries doing uh, similar to what Scotland is doing, um, and it is a global issue, so we are talking about globally. And would you see it as possibly appropriate uh, that it might be recognised in the principles of the bill? On the face of the bill? Well, I... Yeah. Legislation is actually about making law. So, you know, you would have to be, you know, from the point of view of drafting things like that, uh, uh, how you draft that into actual law as opposed to policy statements, which are different, uh, I'm not clear and I wouldn't want to venture uh, an opinion on because, for me, a piece of legislation is about the practical side of things rather than... Rhetoric. We don't legislate rhetoric in this country generally. In fact, most countries don't. But surely the principles, Cabinet Secretary, would contextualise the, the, the purpose well, of the Well, I, I haven't seen a list of principles, so it would be helpful if you could outline what this list of principles might look like, and it might be more easy for um, SGLD then to give an initial 
sense of whether or not they think that is something that can be or cannot be legislated? Well, um, often in bills, as, as you'll know as well as I, and probably better, there, there are um, at, at, the, at the top of, um, or near the top of it, there are uh, principles um, uh, which contextualise, as I say, a bill. And, and the word include is very important, obviously, because otherwise it could be a list that um, uh, is exclusive rather than inclusive. But I just wondered whether intergenerational justice might be one of those principles that was um, important. Well, the bill as highlight. introduced is about target setting. If effectively, that. what you're talking about is then if pretty much changing the, the long title of the bill. I think that would be what you would end up having to do. And that then, at, at that point you were doing that, changes the bill completely. I mean, I, you know, there are, there, are, there are issues around doing this this way. In terms of the principles for target setting, um, which aren't so much um, contextualising the whole of the Act, but a very, very specific requirement on ministers and the CCC to consider these in deciding what targets should be. So they've played an important role in, um, in recent discussions. We have, in response to stakeholder um, requests, looked at making a couple of minor amendments to the principles as they're currently wording, worded to better reflect um, the um, fair and safe emissions budget and um, the Paris Agreement. Um, if I recall correctly, and Tom will correct me if I'm wrong, intergenerational justice is, um, is not one that we um, have been specifically asked and encouraged to put in there for the reasons that the cabinet secretary say that the whole purpose of the bill is intergenerational justice it's to you know end our contribution to climate change for the benefit of future generations um, so it's unclear how uh, an additional principle of intergenerational justice would make any different practical effect thank you and um, in terms um, of the just transition commission uh, as you'll know, but for the record, Cabinet Secretary, the uh, committee recommended that the government, I quote, keep an open mind, um, unquote, in relation to, and then again, a quote, establishing just transition commission with a statutory underpinning um, or considered um, an independent parliamentary commission. Um, and uh, the government has stated that it's giving this further consideration. Um, and in, in your recent letter... Again, very quickly for the record, um, uh, you state um, that having carefully considered it, we remain unclear why a statutory basis is needed. Um, we remain open to further discussion with the committee on these matters, but would wish to be convinced the positive case before um, bringing forward additional amendments. And so uh, in that context, could I ask you, ask you what work the, um, your government and yourself and your department has done on the options and merits of pursuing a statutory route for the Just Transition Commission? Um, and um, has there been consultation with um, relevant stakeholders on this? Um, our position is, as stated, that we, we, we don't see uh, um, uh, the necessity for this. I think I've outlined in uh, previous sessions here that there are implications for uh, um, putting this on a statutory basis that include cost implications um, as well. Um, what, we've in, what we've proposed to do is bring forward amendments that would put the principles of just transition on the face of the bill as matters that have to be considered when preparing climate change plans. Um, and I think those principles are probably fairly uh, well rehearsed. Um, uh, and... Uh, um, I, I think that uh, uh, at the moment, uh, um, you know, we are looking at uh, the options and pros and cons of a statutory basis. Stakeholders are involved in conversations, but I'm, I, I'm still not convinced uh, that it is necessary. The Just Transition Commission that we have set up is already working, is, 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 is working well, is doing its work, and I fail to understand what the purpose of actually making that statutory um, uh, would actually achieve uh, at this point. So, um, uh, uh, you know, from perspective of where government is, we're, we're talking to try and get an understanding of why it's really thought to be so important. Um, but I have to say, 
um, that at the moment, um, the, the, the way the Just Transition Commission is working ought to give some uh, comfort to people um, that what is, what is currently in place um, uh, will do the job. A, a number of um, stakeholders who've spoken to myself and I'm sure to others and to, and to, and to you um, have found it, uh, I use the word puzzling, that um, the um, Just Transition Commission is set up for two years when net zero is up to 2045 and, and just transition principles um, should be um, underpinning the whole process. So um, I, I, I find it difficult to understand why um, two years seem to be um, appropriate and governments can change. So Well, governments can change, yes. but then governments change and then they change the law. So I'm not entirely certain that you know, putting it in statute protects it from some future government, which you would have to argue would then be hostile to, to all of this. And I, I'm, I'm not clear that that is the case. Now, I've already indicated that we'll put the principles of just transition at a stage two amendment into the bill as being integral to the development of climate change plans so that the climate change plans uh, will need to take them into account. The Just Transition Commission was set up uh, initially for two years and then we you know I think I've said on a number of occasions that when they when they then report to us at that point we will reconsider uh, uh, what then is the best way to take the whole just transition issue uh, forward uh, all we're not doing at this moment is saying that the only way to do this is through a statutory uh, um, a, a, a statutory body um, I think it's really important if government's going to set up a statutory body that there be absolutely strong arguments for doing so um, and a clear rationale for it that can't be met in, in any other way. Um, uh, and I don't think that is clear yet. And some stakeholders may take the view that you're taking, but not all stakeholders do. Um, there are a wide range of stakeholders. Um, uh, um, so it's not by any means a unanimous position. I hope I didn't imply that it was. <laughs> um, no, but I think but it's you know it, it, it's you know there are, there are there are a variety of voices out there, and I would I would ask members to give the Just Transition Commission some time to do its work, and then consider at that point what is the best way to take this forward. Just to highlight one of the points that, that you've made and and put a different position to that. Um, you, you say that other, other um, governments in the future may disagree, but surely one of the reasons for enshrining something in statute is that it's harder to repeal than if, it, if it's not uh, there on the face of a bill. And so I wonder if you've got any comment on that, Cabinet Secretary. Well, that's why we're putting the principles in, yes. Right, and f just finally... Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, for the record, what, what's the government's view on establishing an independent parliamentary commission? Well, I'm, I'm not very sure of what that would be designed to achieve. Um, uh, the role of parliament is to scrutinise progress. Um, what a parliamentary commission w would achieve, I'm, I'm not entirely uh, certain, and I, I'm, I'm not sure what value people think it would necessarily add. I'm sure some stakeholders will be informing you of that. Okay. Well, they may very well be, but yeah. you know, you know, with right. the greatest of respects, you know, littering the entire landscape with various different bodies and commissions isn't actually necessarily going to do the job for us. So okay. we just need to take a, take a step back and and be certain that we're not cluttering things up. Rather than, I mean, from the point of view of government, in terms of uh, a, a global climate emergency. One of our jobs is to, to consider whether or not we can declutter, not add clutter. So I'm, I'm just a little bit uncertain what a parliamentary commission would bring to this, and what role it would have, what, what it would mean in terms of, of what we were doing, because it couldn't, it couldn't, you know, I mean, government, whoever forms the government is the government. Okay, moving on to questions from John Scott. Um, thank you. Just one question on this subject, the Just Transition Committee, and I would say that I share the, the Cabinet Secretary's views that I don't think it needs to be put onto a strategy basis. However, I would say that it's been suggested to me that, that agriculture and land um, 
youth interests are underrepresented on that Just Transition Commission as it stands at the moment. I was just wondering if that's a view you shared and if there was anything you might want to do about it. Well, I very specifically made sure that land interests were actually represented directly on the, on the, on the um, Just Transition Commission. And, and I think when people were first talking about just transition, they probably weren't thinking about terms of, of, of land interests. Um, uh, um, so that has been a, um, a conversation that's been embedded into this. Um, I can't just off the top of my head tell you the names of the people on the commission who are representative of it, but they are there. The, uh, it's also the um, land use and agriculture is very, very much on the minds of the Just Transition Commission. It's an important um, element of their of their work program it is something that they will be exploring. There's going to be a specific meeting <coughs> about that, which will invite people from that sector and um, community representatives that is definitely being covered. Well, to you for that reassurance. Thanks very much. Do you want me to yes. carry on to the next series of questions, which takes us back again to agriculture? And uh, this is with regard to uh, nitrogen use efficiency. And I just want to ask Cabinet Secretary, is it now feasible? to introduce a smart target for nitrogen use efficiency, and how do you see that evolving? Um, I, I think our view at this point is that it would be difficult to set any kind of target because we need to be absolutely um, aware of all the benefits, impacts, and future implications. Um, but we are actually doing work directly on this, um, uh, and we are... Um, uh, uh, you know, we are, we are funding research directly on it, uh, uh, on aspects of it, um, uh, because we do see it as something that we will have to uh, ensure we get right. Um, so the, the, there is work currently being done, uh, an analysis of the current accounting tools being done at SRUC um, in collaboration with the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology, and that, that you know, that's the kind of thing that we need to be uh, we need to be very clear about um, our knowledge and our understanding of those aspects of nitrogen accounting and management aren't yet in a place where uh, being able to set a specific target would uh, would be sensible. But um, it, it's certainly something that we we think needs to to be worked on um, and uh, and considered actively, and we are doing so. Progress. Thank you. And so what are the key risks and threats to researching and publishing more detailed information on emissions in the wider agricultural sector and, and what are the benefits to providing this information? Um, right, well, I mean, we're, we're, we're currently uh, exploring uh, a, a lot of alternative methods to provide um, further estimates of emissions from the wider agriculture sector. And I know that there is a considerable degree of unhappiness amongst the agriculture sector that they're not credited with a lot of the really good work they do. Um, unfortunately, the, 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 the way of, uh, uh, of accounting is, is a kind of global kind of agreement and therefore we're not allowed to, I mean, we can't change things. Um, uh, in terms of our own uh, greenhouse gas inventory. Um, however, I, I do think that there are um, uh, there's, there's some real benefit in trying to come up with a better way to assess, um, even if it's not going to sit in the GHG stats, it nevertheless can be, can be a, 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 a tool to help um, uh, identify with farmers the really good work that's being done, but also to get that out to the wider community. Uh, including the research community, because it's a little bit of a, um, uh, a, a, a little bit of a difficult um, uh, issue, um, and I understand why. Um, uh, so um, we're going to report back to the committee when when we can come up with the potential approaches to uh, to the reporting issue um, and the likely accuracy of estimates. As soon as we've got the work progressed sufficiently in order to make it substantial enough to bring to committee. So the work is ongoing. We are looking at the wider agriculture sector. We are um, thinking about how that can be better reflected, what it can't be done. What we can't do is make it part of GHG because that's um, uh, pinned to 
uh, an international standard that is set for us rather than uh, one that we invent for ourselves. So um, uh, um, that is some uh, of the work that's being done. Um, uh, uh, because there is a lot of work um, out there and, uh, uh, um, uh, and I would want to always credit um, land managers for that work, even if they're not seeing it directly reflected in the official stats and however much they may wish that to happen. As I said, it's not my gift. Um, I, I, I would very much welcome um, what you say and indeed the response to these points in our report. And I think it's uh, real progress. Um, will there be a point where the data on this, as it were, parallel system might be robust enough to be included in annual statutory reports in, in a sort of parallel life universe? Well, I think that's what we would hope. We, we, we can get um, the data into a place where we can do a sort of parallel report. Um, uh, um, uh, you know, we're working, um, uh, we're already doing work um, uh, and I think there's information available already on the Climate Exchange website which relates directly to um, emissions intensity figures for agricultural products so that there is some uh, um, public facing work available at the moment. Um, you know, obviously there are other, uh, um, we, other areas that government support, for example, the carbon positive project which is led by industry um, uh, as well. Um, and um, we are continuing to try and refine the, the data to ensure that it can accurately reflect what's going on at uh, farms. Um, but it's still, I guess, at this point, still um, uh, immature. It's not, it's not really able to be brought together in the kind of way that I anticipate that yourself and uh, other farmers might wish to see it. Um, uh, and there'll be needed to be a lot of work before we are into into that stage. Um, uh, it is, however, our intention to get to that stage. Very much appreciate that. And, and um, direction of travel, and I understand, of course, why you can't see more than you can at the moment. But it's essentially the concept of, as it were, on-farm offsetting. I mean, at the moment, if you're an airline and you want to offset your, your carbon emissions, you can go and plant 100 or 1,000 acres of trees. But if you're a farmer with cows that and produce methane, you can't offset that on your own farm by planting 50 acres of trees, apparently. And it just seems as if... I understand, I understand the argument, because mm -hmm. obviously, you know, you can plant the trees, but what they don't do is get credited to you. That's and I, the and point, exactly. That, yeah. And so that's maybe another concept to explore is, as it were, on-farm offsetting. Just leave the thought with you. George Stevenson. So that would be taking um, a whole farm attitude to emissions. A holistic <laughs> approach, which thank you for, for um, articulating what better yes. than I could for me. Um, I just want, and I suspect this may be more directed at Fergus Ewing than uh, yourself, Cabinet etc. But just given that the um, agriculture uh, role emission that causes most concern is methane, um, I just want to ask in particular, there's one peer-reviewed paper from Australia in 2015, uh, which is on the uh, anti-methanogenic uh, effects of asparagosis taxiformis in vitro. In other words, there is something in seaweed that in the Petri dish prevents uh, methane emission. And there's a 2018 study in the United States, uh, very small, and I can't see a peer-reviewed paper from it on 12 Holsteins that feeding them, uh, feeding them seaweed reduced the methane by 99%. I have to say that sounds implausibly large. But, but the general question is just whether uh, government scientists uh, and others are tracking that to so that we can get to a point uh, where farmers get the kind of support uh, from public resources that might pick those up. And of course, I note in particular that Scotland is quite a good place for seaweed, even if it does mean harvesting kelp. Right, you went um, 
Yeah, that was a very long question to which the answer is we're already doing it here as well, research. Um, and uh, I would invite the committee to go out to the SRUC uh, um, uh, uh, facility um, on the outskirts of Edinburgh, um, where there's an active um, program of uh, testing. So it's not just seaweed that has that impact. If I recall correctly, coriander no, I'm not yes. looking at these officials you're, you're weren't correct. there. You're but there are correct. a variety of different um, uh, natural substances um, which, if added to the feed, look like they do have um, a very direct impact on, on emissions. So um, the, there is work going on around the world on this issue because, um, obviously, it's something that needs to be addressed. Um, uh, and so not only is Scotland looking at what other people are doing, but we are also doing ourselves, and I dare say other people will be looking at us. So um, that's, I guess, as about as far as my technical understanding of this goes. And I, as far as I'm aware, Fergus Ewing is actively, kind of, from, from his policy perspective, pursuing this as well. Uh, questions from Mark Ruskell. Yeah, thanks, Kavina. Um, we, we had some immediate policy announcements uh, on, on day one after the Climate Change Committee's report came out. I'm just wondering what other areas government is working on, what you see as the big challenges for meeting the targets going forward, and when we might expect to see some conclusions. Um, I appreciate what you said earlier that the UK government has a, a role to play in terms of um, you know, various areas, including decarbonisation of the gas grid, and we, we put similar questions to Michael Gove. Um, last week, so there's clearly a, a policy process that is now in train, but in terms of your policy process, what, what can we expect to see coming out of that and, and by when? I, I can't tell you what you can expect to see coming out of it because that would be pre-announcing what is coming out of it and I am not in a position to be able to do that. Um, I, I, as I've already indicated, um, uh, uh, within the portfolios, both at the level of Cabinet Secretary, Minister and senior officials, um, uh, work has already begun uh, uh, to look at, uh, at the specific portfolio areas to identify continuing uh, uh, ways in which we can uh, uh, make the achievements that uh, we want to make. I've already flagged up that it's going to be a uh, um, uh, central part of the programme for government. Um, please don't ask me uh, what that will look like. That is a matter entirely for the First Minister, um, and it will be her decision um, what does and does not appear in the programme for government. Um, it, is, uh, it is an enormous concession, I think, historically, to be told this far in advance that climate change will be uh, uh, an integral part of that programme for government. So, um, uh, so the work is happening right now. Um, uh, we're already doing it. Anything that I can, for example, identify in my own portfolio that can be done more quickly or brought forward or differently without having to go through. And here's the thing, without having to go through the usual panoply of consultation, impact assessments, etc. Uh, and I need to remind everybody here that the issue of that, you know, the processes of governments don't go away. Um, uh, I don't have a magic wand that makes all of that go away. So the issue is, what can we identify that doesn't require to go through all of that? And I don't know what we will be able to come up with, and that would be much shorter term. Uh, um, into a more medium and long term, what, uh, uh, what changes um, and policy proposals there might be, which will nevertheless still require to go through the sausage machine. So I'm hearing then that the, the programme for government is going to be key, but what are the kind of areas, subject areas, I'm not going to ask you to identify policies, what are the kind of broad subject areas that government is currently looking at in relation All to the All portfolios have been asked to look within, and I have flagged up even in those for those portfolio areas that haven't hitherto regarded themselves to be on the front line. So there's a, there's a handful of portfolios, for example, you know, um, uh, uh, the rural economy, transport, uh, um, uh, um, you know, um, and housing that, that people see as being an energy, that see as already being part of the, you know, that wider team. Um, but I have, I have flagged up that, that 
all policies now, all policy portfolios, uh, all, all areas need to be looking at what they can do. So, you know, even if they've not necessarily seen themselves in that, in that way, um, they have to know. So that will be happening across the whole of government. So we're not picking out, we're, we're just basically saying this has to be an all government approach. So, what? Please. Um, okay. Uh, I mean, one area which is in your portfolio and which there is a current consultation on is the Climate Challenge Fund yeah. and the future of that fund. Um, you know, you, you'll obviously recognise the, the, the important work that's taken place and the thousand projects that have blossomed across Scotland. Um, what, what do you see as the vision for that fund? Do you, do you believe that it should continue to expand in its budget? Uh, well, is there a different way of, of engaging with communities and engaging with hard-to-reach individuals and the public? Well, the, 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 the review um, uh, uh, that has been ongoing is um, uh, not yet uh, uh, out there. I haven't made um, uh, uh, any decisions in respect of that, but um, in terms of my portfolio, um, as I said, everything now has to be up for scrutiny, um, and that is really everything. Um, uh, so all... Uh, uh, funding for community action on climate change um, has to be uh, looked at in, in this regard uh, to make sure that uh, uh, what we're doing is the right thing um, and, uh, and that is uh, currently uh, ongoing. Um, uh, there's been a lot of discussion about uh, numbers um, uh, but um, the reality is uh, that this uh, from the point of view of community projects has been uh, incredibly successful. It's been supporting communities across Scotland uh, to take action. Um, uh, it's the only fund of its kind in the UK, but I think that this is the right time to just consider whether the approach that we've been taking over the last 10 years is the right one to help deliver what we're all agreeing now is a step change that is needed, and that's what we're thinking about, and that's happening across my portfolio in the same way as it's happening across everybody's portfolio. Okay. And another question from John Scott. Um, thank you, uh, convener. And can I just take to the climate change plan, please, uh, Cabinet Secretary, and given that the climate change plans largely collate and present information and commitments set out in other strategies, will a revised climate change plan present a truly integrated approach? I would certainly hope that it would. And what is the timetable and process for the new climate change plan? Could I be really clear about what it is we're actually discussing here? Because we have committed to um, a review of the existing climate change plan within the first six months um, of, the, of the passing of the bill. If you're talking about a brand new climate change plan, that's a different, that's a different animal entirely. Um, and I think... Um, it would be advisable for the committee just to think about the difference between doing that. I mean, six months is not a long time, so it's not a complete, entirely start from scratch, renew the whole plan. We're talking about the, the current one, yes. The current right, one, yeah. yeah. Well, what we've what we've agreed to do is to do that within the within the six months, which is what the um, which is what the committee actually asked for. Uh, um, uh, uh, and you know that does mean that you know you're you're because you're doing it on a much shorter time scale. It cannot it will not be as detailed as if you were doing a whole new plan. It cannot be. Um, uh, it, it's impossible in terms of time scale to manage that within the six months. Um, so so we will do that that you know r review and revisal. Um, she, Sarah's worried I use a phrase. <laughs> Don't <Just> do it. <laughs> but it's, 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 you know, because we've got that set time scale for it, um, uh, uh, it, it cannot be as if we were doing a whole new plan. And, and I think that's an important thing for, the, for, for people to I, understand. I appreciate that, of course, but notwithstanding, I mean, will it be, will it involve stakeholders in an industry or will it be open to all the general public? I appreciate the constraints yeah. of time as, as laid out in your response to our report. I very well understand that, but notwithstanding, 
would you like to comment on how wide um, you will consult in that well, regard? Well, that will be um, uh, 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 some of the engagement over the summer will feed into that because although the six month trigger doesn't happen until the Royal Assent, um, and that's now not going to happen until autumn, um, nevertheless, the work that we do, the public engagement uh, that we do over the summer will be something that we will use to then feed into the the the, the revisal uh, you know of of the of that plan so uh, um, yes there will be uh, as much engagement as we can and I've indicated that I will let the committee know as soon as we've got um, a, a formal timetable for that engagement so that you can see the areas that you might want to engage with um, uh, so um, so that will that will that will involve all stakeholders and since that is pinned directly onto the target of zero uh, of net zero emissions it will then itself feed into the six month revision of the climate change plan thanks okay further questions on climate change plan from Magus mcdonald just just briefly uh, convener um just sticking with the climate change plan and, and scrutiny um of, of the ccp what discussion is currently held with the a climate change committee prior to finalising CCPs? Um, well, uh, I mean, obviously, the CCC have a statutory role. Um, uh, there are independent advisors, and that's basically what informs our engagement with them. Um, they will, um, uh, they've already set out their views on the most recent uh, plan, um, uh, and we take and, and and those views and that engagement takes place while it's a draft plan um uh, and then uh, we uh, have consideration for those when we're preparing the final uh, version of the plan um uh, and i just need to remind committee members that the final version of the plan was only just published in february of this year um uh in term sorry last year sorry <laughs> um uh, uh so um that seeking CCC views on draft climate change plans won't change. Um, the, the ability of the CCC to operate within the time scale that you know the committee recommended for the revision of the of the of the current plan um, and the uh, uh, is is you know I'm not certain. So we will we will in, ensure that they are aware of what we're doing and if they wish to to make some uh, uh, comment they can. But I think as, as committee members know, I mean, the Committee for Climate Change doesn't do immediate advice. So how actively they will be able to be involved in the revision is another matter entirely. And, you know, uh, uh, that is a challenge. And that's back to the phrase I'm not allowed to use, that the six months <laughs> I'll tell you privately afterwards when the microphone's switched off. But the six months is is a tight time scale, and that means it's a tight time scale for everybody, including the CCC. Rounding off questions on the climate change plan, Mark Ruskell. Uh, it's about proposed scrutiny, uh, the 120-day period. Will that take recess or dissolution into account? Uh, so, um, I mean, have we? Uh, 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 I don't think there's been a final decision on 90 or 120 days. Um, uh, I, I think our, we, we accepted, I, th I think what we've said is 90, uh, a 90 day parliamentary scrutiny period. Um, prepared to accept 120. Oh, I'm told that we are prepared to accept 120. Um, uh, if we start, my view is if we start building in recesses, I mean, how long is this all going to take? And you know, if we have a climate emergency, why would we be making things even longer and more difficult? So. And now to, uh, back to Angus, questions on carbon credits. Thanks, just briefly um, on, on that. Um, will the government be bringing forward amendments at stage two to require an enhanced affirmative procedure to use carbon credits? And um, what more could the government do to ensure that there's adequate scrutiny? Uh, of the use of carbon credits? Uh, well, we're still exploring the possibility of further amendments in respect of that, um, but I'm not clear what is meant by enhanced affirmative procedure. If you mean the super 
affirmative procedure, then it, it would be more straightforward unless the committee has got some other new procedural form in mind, and I wasn't clear uh, what that might be. So uh, um, that would help to clarify for us. If you mean super affirmative, is that what you mean? Super yeah. affirmative, right, okay. Um, I mean, obviously carbon credits have never been used. Um, uh, we've set out clear policy commitments not to use them. Um, there's a legal limit uh, uh, of zero in any future use unless Parliament actively uh, agrees. So uh, I'm not 100% clear what amendments to that would would make a difference. What what you know what 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 would you would want there that wasn't already there? Okay, fair enough. Just, just in that regard, I was in Ireland last week and much talk about climate change, and they very definitely they're going down the route in Ireland of carbon credits in terms of mitigation, and and therefore. Would it not be a pity to close the doors on the ability to use carbon credits um, should a need arise? Because it, without dispute, it seems that it's entirely linked to the, the growth of the economy, uh, the, the carbon emissions, and they have proved that to their own satisfaction on three occasions in Ireland. I mean, the, the, the two big issues around carbon credits are this. First of all, all you're doing is exporting your emissions um, uh, when you do that. Um, and secondly, it, it's incredibly expensive and will probably get even more expensive. Um, uh, Ireland may uh, theoretically be talking about that, but you know, as Sweden does, but um, whether or not when it comes to it, they actually will um, is a different matter entirely. Um, and I just think from, from our perspective, the, the, you know, what we are doing is you know, talking about domestic effort and, and not just exporting. I mean, carbon credits really are just letting somebody else kind of do the emitting for you. Uh, and that doesn't seem to me to be a particularly moral way to approach this. Okay, and, and finally, um, can I ask you about the financial resolution and given the government's lodged and planned amendments, does the government intend to lodge a new financial resolution? We were told at the outset that this would cost um, £13 billion. Do you see any change to that figure uh, or a figure which seemed to lack reliability from our perspective? But if you have any comments to make on that, I would certainly be interested to hear them. Well, the, there isn't a financial resolution at uh, uh, um, present because the direct costs of the bill um, are well below the £400,000 per year um, threshold. Um, the, in terms of what's happening around the discussions, the, the, the only current thing that might change that is the discussion around Just Transition Commission because, as I said, there would be a cost to that. Um, uh, uh, you know the, the the figures that you're talking about are the are the you know 2045 figures, which I don't think you can really reflect in a financial resolution in a bill going through Parliament in 2019. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. Um, that is the end of our session. I'd like to thank the cabinet secretary and our officials for their time today. Um, at its next meeting on the 28th of May, the committee will be taking further evidence from stakeholders on the Climate Change Emissions Reductions Bill at Stage 2. And that concludes our meeting in public today. Mm -hmm.